This is a brief video on valvular diseases of the left heart. We're going to be going through aortic valve stenosis, aortic valve regurgitation, mitral valve stenosis, and mitral valve regurgitation. Now it's worth noting that sometimes the regurgitation diseases are also called insufficiency. So we will be talking about aortic valve insufficiency, which is the same as aortic regurgitation. Before we begin, we have two pathology pictures here. The left one is an aortic valve stenosis, and the right one is a mitral valve stenosis. Now let's jump right into them. Let's start with aortic valve stenosis. Aortic valve stenosis is defined as the failure of the aortic valve to open. This happens during systole when the ventricles contract. The etiology comes from three main causes. The most common is the last one listed there, age-related calcification. Now this happens through a mechanism similar to coronary atherosclerosis, so the same risk factors apply. And that's like diabetes, that's hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, it's uh, also obesity doesn't help, smoking doesn't help. One less common cause is rheumatic fever, and even less common than that is a congenital defect, such as a bicuspid aortic valve, which is when the aortic valve is, is made with two leaflets instead of three. The demographic for aortic valve stenosis is usually older people, usually males, again very similar to coronary atherosclerosis. On the physical exam, we hear a murmur. This is a crescendo decrescendo murmur. This means that it increases in intensity and then decreases in intensity. And it's worth noting that the point of maximum intensity in murmurs that correspond to worse disease peak later. So we see that peak in the murmur later with a worse disease. You do see a paradoxical S2 split. You normally see the AV or the aortic valve shut before the pulmonary valve. We do see a split here, but the pulmonary valve may close before the aortic valve. That's with the normal S2 splitting. We do have a carotid pulse that is parvus tardis. That means weak and late. We might also hear rowels in the lung, which is a crackling sound. And the ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a result of aortic valve stenosis. On clinical presentation, the patient might have angina, which is increased oxygen demand. This is this makes sense because we see that we have increased tension according to Laplace's law. Since we have more pressure in the left ventricle because we're not able to get through that valve, we have increased tension, so there will be increased afterload leading to a higher O2 demand. We also have decreased O2 supply because we have diastolic dysfunction as a result of the left ventricular hypertrophy. So we will not be able to perfuse the coronary arteries as well. So both of those contribute to angina. Patient might be short of breath. We might have dyspnea. This is a result of backing up of pressures. The left ventricle backs up, then the left atria, and then fluid backs up into the pulmonary circulation, which causes pulmonary edema leading to shortness of breath. Might also see syncope with exertion. This happens often when we have low cardiac output. When we exercise, we have dilation of our muscular vasculature, which means that blood is now being split to the muscles. And more blood is going to the muscles, less is going to the brain. If we exercise too much, if we exert ourselves too much, this could lead to passing out to syncope. Treatment for aortic valve stenosis is replacing the valve if the area of the valve gets less than one square centimeter. Normal is uh, is is much bigger than that, four, five, six. And there's also percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty, which is putting a balloon into the valve and kind of breaking it open. This gives you relief for about six months. Uh, relieve symptoms, doesn't solve the problem. Next, we have aortic valve regurgitation. This is defined as the failure of the aortic valve to close during diastole, and thus we have a flow of blood backwards into the left ventricle. As you can see in that picture, we have blood flowing back through the aortic valve as well as blood coming in through the mitral valve. Etiology of this comes from a couple causes. We can have aortic root dysfunction as a result of aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection, and even syphilis infections. We could have problems with the leaflets of the valves themselves, such as infective endocarditis, a congenital problem of the leaflets, and rheumatic fever. Physical exam, we see another murmur here. This is a diastolic murmur. You can see this in the bottom right picture. It's decrescendo, so it's decreasing in intensity. It's pretty high pitch. You hear it best at the fourth left intercostal space. Again, during diastole, as you can see in that D line of that picture there, we do see a widened pulse pressure. This means that we have a lower 
diastolic pressure and a higher systolic pressure. So there's a wider pulse pressure. Diastolic pressure decreases because our left ventricle dilates with volume overload and the left ventricle compliance thus increases. And again, we see a systolic increase because we have more volume with each beat. We have two sources of blood coming into the left ventricle with each beat, thus increasing systolic pressure. Physical exam shows a large global heart on the chest x-ray and patient symptoms. Again, we have angina. There's more demand. The left ventricle is getting bigger, might become hypertrophic. So there's more demand to supply those myocardial cells might have heart failure, the left ventricle dilates. This is a volume problem. We might have left ventricular dilation and subsequent remodeling can cause systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. So that could back up again into the left atria and into the pulmonary circulation. We treat aortic valve regurgitation with vasodilators. This lowers the systemic vascular resistance and promotes blood going in the proper direction, promotes blood going forward. The left ventricular function is very impaired with an injection fraction less than 50. We can repair the aortic valve with surgery. Next one is mitral valve stenosis. Mitral valve stenosis is narrowing of the mitral valve or failure of the mitral valve to open. This happens during diastole when the atria contract. Uh, you cannot get blood from the left atria to the left ventricle. The valve area, by definition, for mitral valve stenosis is less than two square centimeters. It's normally four to six. This is usually caused by rheumatic fever. It can also be congenital. Infective endocarditis can cause this. And again, calcific disease can cause this as well. Physical exam, we do hear a murmur here. There's an opening snap. That's a, a noise you hear of the mitral valve snapping open, especially if it's calcific, can make a pretty loud noise. We do have a diastolic decrescendo rumble. So again, during di diastole, a rumbling sound there is sometimes an increase at the end. I'm going to try to point to it here during, uh, during diastole where the intensity of the murmur goes up due to atrial contraction, pushing that last bit of blood up. You can see that where that arrow is pointing right now. That's the increase at the end of the murmur. This murmur is heard best at the apex of the heart. You might hear rowels in the lungs here, again, corresponding to pulmonary edema. On the ECG, we do see a right ventricular hypertrophy and left atrial enlargement. We do not see left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG, and that's pretty characteristic of mitral valve stenosis. Helps you differentiate from the other, from the other diseases we're talking about here. So, left atrial hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy. In the clinic, patients come in short of breath. They have high left atrial pressure, which can be transmitted to the lungs, again causing pulmonary edema. You might have hemoptysis. So if the pressure in the lungs gets really high, sometimes we have collateral channels that form from the pulmonary veins to the bronchial veins. If one of these unstable collateral channels rupture, we might end up with blood in the lungs called hemoptysis, coughing up blood. And of course, right heart failure shows the same typical symptoms. We have increased JVP, high pressure, sometimes seen in the neck. We can also have leg edema, swelling of the legs. We have ascites, swelling of the abdomen, and hepatomegaly. We have a large liver, all as a result of right heart failure. That is a result of the left heart failure. So the left heart failure pressures back up through the pulmonary system into the right heart, causing these systemic symptoms. AFib can happen too. If we're not able to pump blood from the left atria to the left ventricle, the left atria can get big. We can have stagnation of blood uh, and the stagnation, or more specifically, or more relevant to AFib, the enlargement of the left ventricle can cause conduction problems, causing atrial fibrillation. And as I said before, stagnant blood can embolize and cause clots. This can lead to a stroke. So patients who have AFib related to mitral valve stenosis should be on anticoagulants. Treatment for this is diuretics for the pulmonary and systemic congestion. That'll relieve symptoms. We can also do percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty, which is shown in that top right picture there. We put a balloon, break open the valve. We can also replace the valve, the valve here and, uh, and do commissurotomy, which is also going in, breaking the little connections between the, the, the mitral valve leaflets, between the mitral valve flaps that are preventing it from opening.
And the last disease we're going to talk about is mitral valve regurgitation. This is the failure of the mitral valve to close during systole. And we'll see again that the murmur for this one happens during systole. This can come from primary mitral valve regurgitation or secondary mitral valve regurgitation. Primary mitral valve regurgitation or acute mitral valve regurgitation can be caused by a papillary muscle problem. Papillary muscles can rupture from a myocardial infarction, usually due to a block in the right coronary artery. We can also have primary MR due to a disorder of the valves, such as mitral prolapse, when the valves go backwards into the left atria, completely flip backwards, opposite direction that they're supposed to be pointing. Secondary MR can be a result of an underlying myocardial problem. We're not going to get into that, but there are other causes of mitral valve regurgitation. On physical exam, we again hear another murmur. This one is during systole, which is when the mitral valves should be closed. When they're failing to close is when we hear the murmur. This is a hollow systolic high pitch murmur. Hollow systolic means that it's the same intensity throughout all of systole. It's heard best at the apex. You might hear rails in the lungs, again corresponding to pulmonary edema. ECG shows acute inferoposterior myocardial infarction if the papillary muscle is ruptured. So we're going to see inferior leads on the EKG showing myocardial infarction. Could be a STEMI if the papillary mu muscle is the cause of the mitral valve regurgitation. Clinical presentation for MR is dyspnea if it's acute MR, which is as a result of a sudden increase in the left atrial pressure from backflow of the blood. So this increased left atrial pressure, because blood is going backwards into the left atrium, uh, has, has a high pressure. That pressure is transmitted back to the lungs. Pulmonary edema, again, cause of shortness of breath. Chronic mitral regurg has low cardiac output. So over time, if we keep pumping blood backwards into the left atria, that left atria is going to dilate, uh, which cause, allows for even more blood to flow backwards into the left atria, which means that less blood is flowing forwards, which is the normal direction of cardiac output. This means that we have a low cardiac output into the systemic circulation, and the patient can experience weakness or fatigue might see right heart failure as a result of that. Higher pressures in the left atria back up through the lungs into the right heart, cause the right heart to fail. And then we see typical right heart failure symptoms such as leg edema and ascites. Left ventricular contractile dysfunction can happen. This is again a result of lower forward cardiac output. And this as it backs up through the right or through the left atria and into the pulmonary system can cause dyspnea. Treatment for MR is surgical correction of the papillary muscle if that's the source of the problem surgical correction of the mitral valve if that's the problem if we have a lot of pulmonary edema we can give diuretics to relieve symptoms we can also give vasodilators to promote forward cardiac output instead of the instead of the blood going backwards through the mitral valve it might be more likely to go forwards through the aortic valve if we have less systemic vascular resistance in the systemic circulation and we can achieve that with vasodilators for secondary mitral regurgitation, we want to treat the underlying myocardial problem. We want to treat left ventricular contractile dysfunction and allow that to, to rectify the normal function of the left ventricle in pumping blood forward as opposed to back through the mitral regurge. 